I was going to tell you all that I was going to do a totally new talk, and I am going to do a talk because I know a number of you have heard my dog and pony show before. But um, it takes uh, quite a, it takes a little bit of understanding about what I used to do to make you understand that why this body of work is kind of a major sea change for me in terms of how I make my art. Um, my people think of me as a photographer, and, and in the most like basic way, yeah, I used to work with a camera at one time, but I approached it a lot differently than um, how I was trained in the field of photography. I came up at the time uh, that the popular movement uh, that uh, the professors I was studying under were influenced by was called New Topographics. And it was very much about going and exploring absolutely with a straight camera eye, um, unmanipulated uh, the effects of man on the environment. Um, and it, uh, I was never able to make a straight photograph, and that's no pun intended, but um, I, um, I always set up something in the studio. I always manufactured what I did. I was very influenced by the pictorialists. I was very influenced by a lot of people that set up what you know, we were taught to hate in college, which is the soft pictorialist manufactured image. Photography was supposed to be objective recording of reality. And, you know, even as a child, um, I think you've, a number of you have heard me talk about this before, I was always fascinated by Bigfoot and UFOs. And growing up in Dallas, Texas, I would sit in my bed at night terrified that somehow Bigfoot would find his way from the Pacific Northwest down through some river system to suburban Dallas. Then I found out that there was a Bigfoot in Arkansas, at the Texas-Arkansas border. Um, the town of Falk, Arkansas, and yes, it's, it's F-A-U-K-E, but they don't, they, they pronounce it a little more base. And so that made me even more frightened because they had a whole film on it. It was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And um, this Bigfoot creature we had photographic evidence of. We had, you know, blurry photographic evidence. We had film evidence of it. And even as a kid, I was fascinated with the idea that you could have a picture of something that did not necessarily have to exist. And that fascinated me because, you know, photographs are admissible as evidence in court, but we all know in the digital age you can manufacture a photographic image just as easily as you can manufacture, you know, a painting. And so my work has always been about the tension between um, what is real and what is not in a photographic image. But over the course of 25 years it's advanced quite a bit um, and moved away from what I was doing um, a quarter of a century ago. The easiest way to explain what I was doing a long time ago is I was making real photographs that looked fake and taking fake photographs and making them look real. A uh, long time ago, um, I abandoned the idea of taking a photograph of an object because as a photographer, wanting to, your work to be seen as art was very difficult because in photography, people always go back to, well, what paper is that printed on? And what lens did you use? And what's the aperture? And you get to the point that you're like, well, that's not the point of what I'm doing. I mean, you don't go up to a painter and say, is that brush sable or synthetic? <laughs> you know, is, is that oil, you know, blah, 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 or something like that. You don't do that because, you know, you want to talk about the imagery. So I got the idea of removing imagery from my photography. And I started making very simple drawings and photographing them. They were circles, they were lines, and I would photograph them as badly as possible. And by that I mean, I would kick the camera while I was photographing it. I would go as far out of focus as I could. I would go as overexposed as I could or as underexposed as I could. Now here's the connection to go back to Bigfoot photography and ghost photography. You see a photograph of a ghost or what people say is a ghost. You know, They have a photograph and they say, I took a picture at the top of the stairs and when I developed it there was this blur and that's grandma. Um, <laughs> but it's just a blur. But it's changed the photograph. The camera has caused something to happen to the image that wasn't in the original image. And so these minimal drawings I was making, as I photographed them badly, the camera changed the drawing and made it something else. And then I would destroy the drawing. So all you had is the negative. Then I would make one print of the image and then I'd destroy the negative. So you were back to something that was a hybrid. What's it a photograph of? The answer is yes. Is it a photograph or a drawing? The answer is yes. It gloriously sat the fence. But people started seeing it just as pure minimalism. And, and it's hard to describe what's happened to the movement of minimalism um, in the course of art history because minimalism at one time was very much 
tied to uh, a, a sort of a personal spirituality and an expression of something greater than yourself that couldn't be put in objective terms. Um, now it reminds me of the lady in Korea who can sing, she doesn't speak English, but can, she can sing pitch perfect and sound exactly like Karen Carpenter. And so she's done a whole career of going and singing the Carpenter songs, but she doesn't know what they mean. And a lot of minimalist artists today remind me of that Korean lady that sings Karen Carpenter songs. It's like, yeah, it sounds like Karen Carpenter, and I love rainy days and Mondays, but you know, it's not, it's, it's not the real thing. Um, and so what I did is I thought, well, maybe now's the time to bring imagery back into my work. And I started with clouds because clouds are something that the viewer brings so much to. You and I can be outside and we can look up at the clouds and um, I can see Abraham Lincoln and you can see a bunny because you're bringing your own experience to it. And so I thought, what a perfect thing to start doing. And so I started taking pictures of clouds, started in Lubbock, uh, driving towards Lubbock because the skies over there are incredible taking images, coming back to the computer, digitally taking that image apart, dissecting it, then reassembling it. Nothing's been added, nothing's been taken away. Things can be emphasized and de-emphasized, but what you ended up with is a photograph made of real elements, but rearranged to look as fake as possible. Then, after that, I decided, well, if I can make a real photograph look fake, why can't I take a fake photograph and make it look real? So even though you know, I was trained in college as a photographer, I draw. I draw a lot. And so I started drawing images digitally, but with the aesthetic of a photographic image, uh, starting to play with ideas of depth of field and the ideas of uh, the aesthetics of early uh, pictorial photography, um, or even photography from the late 1800s. So I was drawing these seascapes, and they looked like a photograph. And I was telling you they were a photograph and they were printed like a photograph, and they looked like a photograph, but they weren't a photograph. They were a digital painting. And so my work evolved more and more. Then figures started appearing in them, then ships. Then they started getting a narrative. And the work had less and less to do with photography and more and more to do with the, the element of, a, of an implied narrative, a storyline. I started um, looking more and more at historical images, and then this huge sort of moment happened to me when we were in Europe in the Prado. And um, I always talk to my students about looking at history. I think it's very dangerous that we have a contemporary art world that hardly ever looks back. All they do is look forward. It has to be new. It has to be the thing. It has to be, I'm going to fly to Miami Basel and look at everything that's sold in the pre-pre-preview to what mega collector and find out what everybody's doing and then I'm going to come back here all doe-eyed with paint chips and photographs of what was happening in, in Miami and go produce a more anemic version of the work I saw there. Nobody looks back. I know an artist um, friend of mine that said, oh, I don't ever look at the old stuff. And that frightened the crap out of me. I have students like that. I have students that I have to go back and give them very basic uh, American or European history lessons about something that I'm kind of stunned that they don't know about. AP students, students who are about to graduate with honors that ignore the past. And you know, the, the thing about, you know, you ignore the past, you're set to repeat the mistakes of the past. And the art that I've been so influenced by myself personally has been the work of the Northern Renaissance, Jan van Eyck, van der Weyden, Hans Memling. I'm very influenced by Thomas Aikens, uh, Frederick Church, all these artists that this work is, is, I sort of feel like somebody in the Dark Ages who's digging up Roman statues that nobody else is looking at. These things are fresh, these are new to me. These are things that you do not see people do anymore because art so much now is about distance, detachment, and irony. And everybody's getting over irony. Irony now is a way that we develop our personalities now when we speak to each other to kind of distance ourselves emotionally. And I think art's doing the same thing. It's getting very ironic. It's getting so ironic it becomes unironic. And I got to the point that I started being so influenced by the work I was seeing at the Prado and the work I was seeing um, at the parts of the Dallas Museum of Art nobody else goes to. And I'd sit in front of Church's iceberg and just be, I'm, I'm having a feeling here I don't get when I'm looking at Oliver Eliasson. And, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just a different thing. And, and I, you know, all this 
fondness. You know, we were taught to hate Thomas Aikens in college. We were taught to hate church in college. We were taught to hate the pictorialists in college. And it was very strange because all these things that were so important to my aesthetic were sort of beaten out of us. I have a good friend, a painter, Michael Toll, and he was a very good uh, figurative painter. And the figurative work was beaten and shamed out of him in school, and it took like five years out of school for him to have the guts to sort of attempt it again. So I'm sitting here looking at these paintings, looking at the palette, um, looking at um, Bruegel, looking at Hans Memling, and looking at how much the palette of where they painted, I used to identify as what an fabulous inventive palette this artist came up with. But when you look at Memling and then you're up in Belgium, those colors in Memling's paintings are what you see when you look out the window, literally. He didn't make it up. He, he looked and he saw it. It was sort of like, you know, Van Gogh didn't make up haystacks. He looked out the window and surprised there were haystacks. So he painted them. Um, church, his palette is so obviously American. You can't mistake it as being a European painting. It's very much tied to the land. And this idea of like, what if I started going into these paintings and pulling out the palettes and pulling out the shapes and using those as elements to create a new work, just like I was doing with the clouds? What if I attempted that? What would happen? So I started in safe territory. I started with the clouds. The two clouds you see on either side of us are some of the first clouds I made that were not based on my own photographs. They're based on um, Hans Memling. They're based on uh, Bruegel. They're based on um, a number of artists uh, from the Italian Renaissance and from the Northern Renaissance. And I found out that by taking these elements out of them, using their palettes, using their shapes, forming something else, I got uh, an image that functioned, you know, absolutely as an original work of art, but was very reverential to, to what had influenced me. I wasn't afraid of hiding my, my roots anymore. It's like going gray. Um, and church, the, the, the paintings for church came from uh, the painting from the National Gallery of Scotland, uh, Frederick Church's Niagara from the American Side. And I've always wanted to see this painting, and somehow when we went to the exhibition at the Kimball, I sort of forgot it was there. And so we came around the corner, and it had that impact on me that so much of when we travel, Steve and me for um, a couple of atheists spend our entire vacations in churches and and museums, but it, you know, you do because you walk into these fabulous structures, you see this work of art, you see Caravaggio in Popolo, in Rome, and it has this impact on you that's just, it's not the same as, you know, Bryce Martin. I love Bryce Martin, by the way, I'm not, I'm not Bryce Martin hating, but um, it's just a different feeling. And coming around and seeing that Niagara, I decided that I could try something other than the clouds. And waterfalls sort of have the same sort of gravitas as the clouds uh, in these paintings I was looking at. So I started playing around with that. And it was sort of like a creative outpouring. I was doing all these studies saying, I wonder if I took this part of this painting as a palette. I wonder if I took this shape. What if I combined this part and this part? It became very much the act of painting. It ceased to be anything about photography. It ceased to be anything about what I was doing earlier and everything that I was doing earlier. It was this combination of something of learning how to do something well enough that you can sort of back away and not think as much about process and thinking more about the images. And so what I consider these as, even though they're digitally printed, I consider them as paintings. They're unique objects. There's not going to be an addition of them. They're on canvas. They're meant to be seen as unique objects. Did you create the images on your computer? Yes. Or, there, or did you, so you didn't, nothing is drawn? Nothing is drawn, but I'm very happy that painters, painter friends of mine can look at these and get up this close to them and still not see that they're not painted by hand. And you know, I'm, I'm really trying to work to make you think that they're painted by hand. And honestly, they are painted by hand. I'm working with a stylus and a pad and a mouse, but the movements I make, the colors I choose are the exact same process as any painter would do. And you know, we have this hierarchy about what's considered, you know, well, here's painting and here's drawing and here's photography and here's computer art and here's macrame. And you know, there's this, there's this hierarchy of what, you know, what creates this, a real work of art. 
And it's a very strangely conservative idea for the visual arts community to have. Is like, oh, you did that on the computer. You didn't paint that. And I'm like, no, you, it, it is painted. Um, there's a whole, you know, for years there's been this whole dialogue in the art community of what constitutes a painting. The same way as what constitutes a photograph. I love the idea of something, much as I talked about in the early part of this talk, I love the idea of something that sits on the fence. That it is a painting, but it isn't a painting. So are these photographs? So you, nothing was photographed? Nope. So directly? From, well, actually, they're from the paintings, literally from the paintings. This is me taking the high-res photograph of Church's Niagara from the American side, literally pulling everything out of it and creating a palette that I'm going to work from to create my own painting. Okay. But I'm using his palette. I'm using his influence. Um, and I'm creating something that, you know, is my aesthetic and a heavy nod to, to the artists that I've been influenced by. Okay. So it's a long way to talk about where, where we're getting to get here with these images now. But it, it really, it, um, John Pomara, a good friend of mine, said, I, I always knew you were a painter uh, when he came to see this show. And that was a big compliment to me because he and I are both, we have a mutual admiration society for what each other do. And it was a nice you know, acknowledgement of, okay, I'm not crazy. But you also, you know, as an artist, you also, you always want to doubt what you're doing. I mean, the moment you stop doubting what you're doing, you're in for trouble. Um, and so there always should be questioning, but there was a confidence in putting this show up of, I am happy with this work. I'm confident with this work. I like the direction it's going. And it's opened up a huge door because I have this other body of work running concurrently with this. That, deals, that still is dealing with um, the ocean and narratives and ideas of the past. But it's fun to watch two disparate bodies of work that you're working on influence each other and kind of go back and forth. And they, they're getting closer to each other now. Then they'll probably split. And you know, some people would say that's schizophrenic. But you, know, you look at Richter, who, Gerhard Richter, who has two separate aesthetics that run concurrently. And they both influence each other. So I don't think there's anything wrong about kind of, you know, not choosing between one or the other, but saying, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do both. Um, about this work, any other questions that you have? Because I know I've, I've talked fast and, and furious, sir. <laughs> well, so these uh, waterfall paintings, I'm, you kind of hinted at the answer already. Um, but uh, when I first, I keep wanting to read these as landscapes, but there's an ambiguity to them. And I was wondering, um, I mean, you told, told us how you came to these, and I'm assuming that it's through church who paints mostly landscapes. So mm -hmm. um, do you read them as landscape paintings or, um, or where, like, because there's a stasis to them, but there's also kind of a dynamic. I love that you see that. I mean, there, there is, the, I, I want that same ambiguity to it, but it, it is obviously a landscape. However, these are much, as much influenced by the act of painting as the painter himself. Turner. If you're familiar with the Turner seascape, there's so many elements of those that are just, you know exactly what you're looking at. And then when you get up and you see the economy of the brushstroke that Turner used to create that wave or that ship, you know, you back away, it's this, this incredible ship. You get up close to it and it's like, you know, one paintbrush, you know, may, or maybe just a of paint, but, but he knows how to put it on the canvas and, and you back away and you see a ship. And I loved the idea of trying to suggest the elements of the landscape with as little as possible. And so, you know, what you see towards the tops of some of these, even if I cut the waterfall out of that, you still would recognize that as sky and ground. And there's not much there. And I love the idea of trying to back away as much as possible and give you as little as possible. It's very important to me that the viewer brings something to the work. I don't like the idea of making a piece of work that you can go in and do the gallery circle with where you know, you're seeing a show and you're like, got it. You know, I want something that you have to kind of, that kind of holds you there and makes you examine it. And so I like not giving you a lot of information. It's sort of the same problem I have with artist statements. Artist statements are very good in art school. It's for you to learn to put into words what you're trying to do. But honestly, you won't know what you're doing for about 20 years until you look back on it and go, oh, yeah, I get it now. And so if you have to read two pages that says, you know, the bunny represents my idea of um, feminism and, you know, 
the, the cloud represents my anger towards you know, industrialization and stuff. If you need a checklist to know what the work's about, the work doesn't succeed at all. So, you know, we, we, everybody keeps saying, I want to see the artist statement, I want to see the artist statement. I don't think you should see the artist statement, you know. Go to the work and pull away from it what you need to pull away from it. And don't have the artist have to sit there and explain, you know, point by point by point. So, long answer, short question. <laughs> Any other questions about the work? Yes, sir. He's, he's an ex-student, so he's trained really, really well. <laughs> he's not a plant. <laughs> very curious um, if there were pieces, well, of course, this might be for your upcoming work, so uh, feel free to not answer this, but I'm curious what was left out, or if there's any, in the selection process, if it, there were any difficult ones that you had to take out of this show. Um, there's another large waterfall that I was very happy with. Um, but when Tally and I were putting, hanging this show um, with Trini, it was, you couldn't put two pieces on a wall. It didn't work because these pieces sort of command your attention. And when you put two against the wall, it's what I like to call jazz hands. It was too much. You know, you had to back away and you're like, put, put the hands down, you know. And so there, were, there was a lot of editing in this show. But I also, for the very first time, am displaying studies for these pieces because I do a lot of studies for them. And I really felt good about the studies enough that I wanted them to be seen. So there's one hanging and then there's some that we've pulled out that are, are on the other side of the wall that you can look at. But it, it really has opened up a huge door for me. And so this painting, you know, I, I went to two other church waterfalls and I've been dissecting and putting those together. Very, very excited about them. But now it's opened up the idea that, you know, I'm not going to be confined by landscape anymore. So, I mean, if you want to know what's coming three years down the line, I have Titian's Flaying of Marcius right now, and I'm, I'm really having fun with it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's really amazing because, like I said, these works are not old to me, and they shouldn't be old to any viewer. They're fascinating. There's so much that can be learned from a historical painting. There's so much can be, that can be learned from the art that came before us. And we're so used to not, you know, oh, well, that's old. I'm going to look at the new stuff, that we lose a, we lose a hell of a lot. Um, yes, ma'am. As much as you said you were influenced by the painter, when I view your waterfalls, a lot of what I see is the early French landscapes of photography from the very beginning of history. It, I can't deny that there's not a huge influence of that. Except, except what you've done is you've taken, like you said, the palette of that and created the, both the painting and the earliest photography. You know, together at its, at its peak, which I think that's real interesting. Well, I'm a huge fan of Jackson, O'Sullivan, and Watkins. That's like the holy trinity to me of, of American photography. And I can't say that I'm, that's not hugely influenced by that, but I guess if you look at these, it could be like William Henry Jackson with a severe astigmatism, um, you know. But I was thinking even the earlier than that, you know, like in the 1800 series well, of um, photography. It's, it's nice to be at a point in the career where there's so many influences that you don't even think are direct influences anymore, but they're there and they're just, they're, they're, they're coming at you all the time. It's like having five parents' voices in your head saying, you know, clean up, you know, you, know, they're, 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 you, you keep hearing these influences even when you don't hear these influences. Um, I can see a number of other things in these. I mean, a, a friend of mine said these paintings look so German and I'm like, oh, Okay, <laughs> but then I started looking at them and I started getting some of, the, of, of what they were talking about. Again, it goes to palette, shape, form, where the work is, what the work brings to, uh, you know, looking at it outside of its environs. Um, you know, looking at Belgian painting or looking at Flemish painting in Belgium is quite a different experience than looking at it in Texas in the middle of the summer or something like that. But you, you, you know, there's so many things that we sort of don't realize that need to be brought to a work of art to look at it. So in a way, I mean, these, 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 painting, these paintings might be as much about the act of looking at art as the subject matter themselves. So. Any other questions? Yes. Um, not specifically about the works, but more about your process. You made the comment about doubt and the role that doubt plays. And if you, you said something like, if the, the artist isn't doubting his or her work, you're in trouble, and I'm just wondering if you could expound on that a little bit. My strongest ideas, 
In fact, I have some, I, this is the first thing I'm, time I've ever written anything down for a talk in my life, but um, I have words of advice for a young artist. And one of them is that my strongest, most well thought out ideas have always yielded my weakest work. My vaguest, strangest, I don't know if this will work ideas are the ones that have kept me going for 25 years. And when there is no sense of doubt and you think, oh, this is gonna be great and stuff like that, you're not looking at the work objectively. You're looking at it, you know, as, as this is my son and he can't do anything wrong and I, you know, you know I deal with these parents all the time, that, you know, <laughs> their, their kid can't do anything wrong. Um, and so if you have that attitude of your work, you're really not able to accurately assess if you've done a good job or not do a good job. So doubt to me is never a bad thing. Doubt is the ability to go back and re-examine something and look at it and say, did I make the right decision? And you know, that the purpose of being a visual artist is to keep working on the mistakes you made in the previous work. Your next painting, your next photograph, your next drawing should always be based on what you did wrong in the previous work and what you're going to do. And that keeps happening. I mean, it, you could apply that to almost anything, not just art. But you know, the cool thing about art is you keep doing this until you die. Um, if, you're, if you're an artist with any integrity, you keep expanding and keep reinventing and, and, and rethinking what you do. And that's what keeps the art fresh and changing. I mean, if you get a shtick, and many artists get a shtick, and the shtick sells, you know, Liberace, <laughs> you know, don't you hate the way people make fun of you, you know, don't you hate the, the, the things they say about you? And he said, yes, I cried all the way to the bank. So, you know, and there are artists that, you know, I don't care what you say about me, I'm cashing a check every month. So, and they're very comfortable. But, you know, I do think that you have to tear everything apart about every five, ten years. And I've really done that. I always kind of called it the David Bowie model of, of visual arts, is you really have to break down what you've done and try something new. And if you're not willing to fail, if you're not willing to fall flat on your face, you're done as an artist already to me. Um, I teach a profoundly talented group of individuals in class every day. I love my job. And I'm not one of those people that says, I love my job because I hate my job. I love my job. But I have kids who have, inst have been instilled in them from birth an abject fear of being wrong. And it's what we've done to education that they are afraid to say the wrong answer. And they'll never come up with an original thought in their life if they're afraid of that. Artists now are afraid of being wrong because the market drives so much now, it's so hot, that artists are afraid to make the wrong move and it makes for some pretty shitty art. And it would be interesting to see more artists doubt themselves and doubt the, the look of the day, the movement of the week. Because there are a lot of artists now that get bought up at 22 and their career is over at 26 because now all the work's being unloaded at auction houses and the collectors are kind of done with them and they're waiting for the next thing. So it's nice to be able to kind of like not ride that wave and just say, okay, I'm gonna turn my back on it and I'm going to really try to make something that I think hasn't been made before in some form or fashion, which seems really odd to go back and say, okay, now I'm gonna go back to Frederick Church, <laughs> you know, but I don't think that's done yet, so. Without giving too many secrets away, could you talk about the process of turning a picture into uh, something that looks like a painting and then the process of putting that on the canvas? Well, it took forever to learn how to do this, and I've never, ever wanted to print work on canvas because you see so much digital art on canvas, and it looks like bad art on canvas. It shines, it breaks down, and I'm using a printer now that's a lacquer-based printer, not um, a... Uh, a printer that's normally used to print canvas. And it's ultra high resolution. And once we started running samples on it, um, I got really excited because there was no image breakdown at all. It literally could print as fine as I wanted it to print and as subtle as I wanted it to print. Because when you're trying to get that smooth of a transition, you just can't do it um, on canvas. But now you can. <laughs> 
and I got very excited. So I, as being opposed to working on canvas, which is strange because I really wanted the, my work to be seen more as a painting than a photograph. It was, you know, it was hard. I mean, people were like, why don't you print these on canvas? And I'm like, because it sucks. But now it doesn't suck, and I'm very excited about it. But you, you, you have to work enough with your computer and that printer and the same material and the same ink, and you have to work with it for like a couple of years to kind of understand what it can do and what it can't do. The round images were a beast because these took like three years to get done because we were trying to stretch them, and they kept we kept ruining canvas after canvas. It's the nice thing about being digital, if you ruin a canvas, you're like, well, press print, and you know we've got another one to try to stretch. But we kept doing this, and I got so frustrated, I put them away until my partner and I were in Rome, and we were in the Borghese Gallery, and there was a round Raphael, and they have it on a hinge, so they could move it so it, the light doesn't strike it at the wrong time of day, so they had it hinged out, and I went to the back and looked, and I was like, it's glued to a panel. And so I came back and I was like, I know how to do this now. So then we tried it again. We made panels. We glued them to the panels and it worked. But again, it was being influenced by something that was close to 500 years old and, and getting the idea how to do it. I hope that explains. How did you, uh, the process of the computer, you know, probably a lot of people in here know how to do this, but when you had your picture of the painting, how did you, uh, again, with that getting too many away, what was the secret to... Well, in Photoshop, the first thing you do is you take the eyedropper tool and you spend a few hours sampling every color that you can possibly discern in that painting and then putting them into families that you save. And so you've got the palette. And then you start cutting out areas and you start deciding, you know, what constitutes a form? Where does this form stop and this form start? What can I do by taking this part of it and this part of it and putting it together? Um, in, in a way, it's almost a cubist way of working. Uh, to start playing, playing with the image. But you end up with massive amounts of information that you've digitally taken apart in this painting and then you start deciding what are you going to play with, what are you going to use, what are you going to bring back in. And then digitally, you, you just start messing with it. And lots of false starts, lots of, ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, it's nice to do that on you know, a computer screen rather than on canvas because I'm not painting over something. I can literally go back and, and go forward again. Well, thank you very, very much for coming on this afternoon that y'all really should be outside for because this is the best weather in Dallas we've had. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the work. Take a time to look at the studies um, around the corner because I'm really happy with those. Thank you.